Preface and Essays 1 through 7 of It's a Good Old World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. It's a Good Old World by Bruce Barton. Being a collection of little essays on various subjects of human interest. Between Ourselves Magazine editors are genial gentlemen. They pay us for the pieces we write and allow us to gather them later into books. To Carl Harriman, editor of The Red Book, George Martin, editor of Farm and Fireside, Harford Powell, editor of Collier's Weekly, W. W. Hawkins, general manager of the United Press Associations, and Frank Ober, editor of Association Men, who have given their cordial permission for the republication of the little essays that follow, I express my gratitude and thanks. The book is named in honor of our common friend, this good old world. I admire the quiet, patient fashion in which he goes around about the same old task, day after day and year after year. I admire his magnificent tolerance toward all sorts and conditions of men, many of whom must frequently prove very irritating passengers. And I want him to understand that, if he has no objection, I plan to ride along with him for another seventy years at least. B.B. It's a Good Old World Essay Number 1 I expect to be entirely consistent, after ninety. A reader writes to reprove me because a statement in a recent editorial apparently contradicts something which I wrote a year ago. A writer ought at least to be consistent, he says which, of course, is the last thing that any writer below the age of ninety ought to be much concerned about. For it is the business of men, whether writers or not, to see truth and to express it in their lives. That a man should see more truth this year than he saw last, and should hope to see even more in the year to come, is a perfectly normal expectation. And inevitably, the larger vision of this year will reveal the shortcomings of the past. I talked the other day with the president of one of the nation's greatest businesses. Said he, I go down to my office these days with a mind absolutely open. I am prepared at a moment's notice to reverse our entire business practice if the conditions demand it. With the world in tumult as it is today, the concern which says, We have always done it this way, or such and such a course is not in line with our previous policy, is riding for a fall. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, Emerson exclaimed. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. Out upon your guarded lips. If you would be a man, speak what you think today in words as hard as cannonballs, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you said today. Ah, then, exclaimed the aged ladies, you shall be sure to be misunderstood. Misunderstood? It's a fool's word. Is it so bad, then, to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. The butterfly is not consistent with the chrysalis. Nobody expects a frog to conform to the standards of the tadpole. Nature is herself the great parent of contradictions, and nothing in her universe is perfectly consistent but the eternal hills and old dogs who lie all day in the sunshine and men whose brains have hardened into shells. A man owes this obligation to himself, that he should keep his vision high and his footsteps fixed in the path that leads toward the stars. Sometimes that path will lie straight and clear. Sometimes it will bend to the left or right. And sometimes he may have to retrace his steps in order to fix his feet firmly upon it. When that necessity arises, there should be no hesitation. I like to remember Dr. David Swing, who was for many years pastor of the Brick Presbyterian Church on Fifth Avenue. Through a long lifetime he expounded the truth to his people as his spirit revealed it to him. At the very end of his days, new truth came to him, and he rose in his pulpit and confessed frankly that all of his previous preaching had been, in large measure, mistaken. 
St. Augustine, toward the end of his career, published a good-sized book called Retractions. Only a big man could have written such a book, for only a big man continues to grow straight up to the very last. Be not too fearful of inconsistencies, for if you are growing as you should be growing, consistency, which is the hardening of the mental and spiritual arteries, ought not to set in until you are ninety, at least. End of Essay Number One Essay Number Two Watching the Prince Earn His Pay The Prince was to ride up the avenue, and we all put on our hats and went out onto the sidewalk to cheer. As he came along smiling with his hat on the side of his head, I could not help marveling a little at the changes time can work. My first ancestor in this country, William, spent several of the best years of his life fighting the prince's ancestor, George. For many, many years, dislike and distrust of the English were fed to us from the pages of our first readers. Emerson's poem expressed the common American judgment about the gentlemen who sit on thrones. God said, I am tired of kings, I suffer them no more. Up to my ear the morning brings the outrage of the poor. Yet here was I, the descendant of a revolutionary fighter, taking time away from the office to cheer for the son of a king, and an English king at that. The explanation, of course, is simple. It is not we who have changed, but the kings. They have at last found a real job for themselves, and we respect them, as we respect any man who has work to do and does it well. They are now the traveling salesmen of their countries. Take the Belgians, for example. Before the war we looked on them as a rather unattractive people, inclined to squalidness both physical and mental. Along comes Albert, their sales manager, with his sample case and opens it before us. He has a fine line of courtesy, something very nice in the way of true sportsmanship, a very superior article of good looks and an entirely modern and up-to-date sense of humor. After we have seen the samples, it is no great task for him to sell us quite a different idea of the Belgians. We will be much more inclined, in the future, to give them what every people have the right to demand, the privilege of being judged by their best, rather than by their less attractive characteristics. So with Edward of the firm of Great Britain and Company. He knows well enough that our dealings with his house have not been altogether satisfactory in the past. He comes with the idea of straightening out all the old complaints and convincing us that this year's line is entirely unlike anything we have previously bought. Are we too much stocked up with the old-style Englishman's side whiskers, prejudices, stodginess, lack of humor, and all? That's our pre-war brand, says Edward. We've entirely discarded that. The house is under new management, and we're putting out a very superior article. Here's a sample of our smiles you never knew an Englishman could smile. Here's a choice bit of democracy which we've recently added to the line. Notice this patent bit of open-mindedness, an exclusive feature of this year's model. He's a good little salesman with a winning smile, and I, for one, am all prepared to put the old prejudices aside and open a good line of credit with his house. I know a man who has a curious job. He is paid just to visit conventions and banquets of his company's customers and tell funny stories. No spasm of economy ever endangers his weekly envelope. He is one of the most valuable assets that the corporation owns. That's the proper kind of a job for a king. Japan should send her emperor sales manager over as soon as possible. Alfonso of Spain would find this a very profitable territory. Italy's Victor Emmanuel had better pack his bag and get some expense account blanks printed. And we, who have no kings, should elect a half a dozen good-looking chaps with a Roosevelt smile and a first-class fund of funny stories to show our customers across the two oceans what a fine lot of folks we really are. The League of Nations will be successful just in proportion to the amount of intelligent, high-powered salesmanship that is put behind it. Every king should plan to live half the time in a suitcase, and every prince, no matter what his title, should consider that he draws his salary for being a prince of peace. End of Essay Number Two Essay Number Three A great little word is why. 
A successful man whom I know recently changed from a business with which he was thoroughly familiar to a business that he knew absolutely nothing about. I watched to see what he would do. For two solid weeks he did nothing but ask questions. He took a train to Washington to learn what information the government had on trade conditions in the new field. He visited around among jobbers and manufacturers. He even went to the company's strongest competitors. Everywhere asking questions. It was simply amazing the amount of useful data that he was able to dig out. Curiosity is a human characteristic that has been much maligned. Men speak of it slightingly, as if it were something to be ashamed of, a weakness to be repressed. My own idea is that when a man gets beyond the point of asking questions, he might as well be dead. Without curiosity, there would be no growth, no progress. There's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, may be a good enough motto for men who are on their way to be shot. But from such men expect no empires to be built, no inventions made, no great discoveries brought to light. Curiosity, the scientific American once said, is the handmaiden of science. No doubt many a man before the time of Columbus had remarked the exotic fruits and branches tossed up by the waves on the shores of the Canary Islands. The natives had gathered them for generations without ever so much as a thought. But to Columbus, those strange gifts of the sea were messages sent from a land where no European ship had ever touched. Out of his wonder about them came his voyage to the New World. Then we have Newton's apple. Things have fallen ever since the universe was created, and no man before Newton seems to have ever asked himself, why? Robert Meyer, a ship surgeon in the East Indies, noticed that the venous blood of his patients seemed redder than that of people living in temperate climates. Doubtless other physicians had also noticed that fact. Meyer, pondering on it, reached the conclusion that the cause must be the lesser degree of oxidation required to keep up the body temperature in the torrid zone. That thought led to the discovery of the mechanical theory of heat, and to the first comprehensive appreciation of the great law of the conservation of energy. If you have witnessed the gradual progress of the mind of a little baby, you have seen a miracle. And what is the golden ladder on which the baby climbs out of mere consciousness into intelligence? Curiosity, nothing else. The constant reaching out for the untried, even though the reaching involves much upsetting of flower vases and many burned and bleeding fingers the eternal why, the unquenchable how and what. Some men climb a little way up that ladder and are satisfied. They reach a point where the day's task becomes more or less automatic, where their feet follow easily along a familiar path, and they are content. They would not pay a nickel to see an earthquake. They would not open a new book or stretch their minds in wonder at what lies even beyond the next desk above them, to say nothing of what lies beyond the stars. Ceasing to be curious, they cease to grow. For surely one secret of genius is this, the ability to remain interested in new things, even into old age. The curiosity of Bluebeard's wife proved fatal, to be sure, and Lot's wife, yielding to her curiosity, reaped a bitter recompense. One must use judgment in the exercise of even the divinest gifts. On the other hand, Zacchaeus, he did climb a tree, his lord to see. And, braving the ridicule of the passing crowd for the sake of his curiosity, he was rewarded with the secret of happiness and everlasting life. End of Essay Number 3 Essay Number 4 Don't lay in a stock of camouflage. It has depreciated badly in value since the war. The future of Germany, I presume, is no particular concern of mine. Yet I keep thinking what a tragic position hers must be for many years to come. Some day, soon or late, Germany, with the others, will send out her ambassadors to the world. He will come to Washington, Herr von somebody, and, smiling graciously, will tell us how eager his government is to resume friendly relations with us. And all the time he is talking, it will be running through the back of our minds, Yes, that is what von Bernstoff said, at the same time when he was trying to blow up our factories and league Japan and Mexico against us. Another German ambassador will go to Buenos Aires. 
I present the compliments of the German government, he will say. And the president of Argentina will be wondering to himself, Is this the same government whose envoy suggested that our boats be sunk so as to leave no trace? German salesmen will hurry out across the world with their sample cases, protesting the value of their goods. And men will wonder whether the statements behind those goods are like the statements made by the German government to the United States when the Sussex was sunk. Bitter as the days are for Germany now, the days to come will be more bitter. For her government ruthlessly torpedoed the good ship Faith. It cut the cables of mutual trust by means of which men have been accustomed to communicate with each other, and the rest of the world stood aghast. Few things in civilization are more inspiring than the slow increase of men's faith in one another. When the psalmist exclaimed, I said in my haste, All men are liars, he was not far wrong. To lie, to cheat, To get the better of a competitor by any hook or crook was the standard practice of early business. The Phoenicians and Greeks, trading with the tribes along the Mediterranean, used to land on the shore, pile up their goods, and then put out a little way in their boats again. Out from their hiding place would come the natives to pile up beside those goods the articles which they offered in exchange, and having done it, they would hide themselves. Both sides wanted to do business. But neither party trusted the members of the other enough to appear beside them on the shore. In religion as well as business, the rule of fraud was the accepted rule. I will sacrifice ten heads to Zeus if I be delivered from the sickness, the pious Greek would exclaim. And being delivered, he would sacrifice cabbage heads instead of heads of cattle, and receive the congratulations of his friends upon the cleverness of his ruse. Little by little, the world has grown away from this kind of practice. As the coral reef grows by the addition of one tiny organism after another, so has faith grown in the world each generation, raising it a bit higher by the addition of its honesty and trust, until all business has come to be done on men's confidence in each other's words. That slow, painfully wrought creation, Germany with wanton hand demolished. We have heard much talk of camouflage, which is a fancy name for lying. Be not misled by that euphonious term. You will live to see a penalty visited on Germany for the slaughter of truth such as has never been borne by any people before. You will see men's words to each other take on a new preciousness in the years to come, because of the terrible price which they will pay who have disregarded their word. In our generation, it will be true as it never has been before that the highest honors will be reserved for the sort of man whom the Bible describes, the man who sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. End of essay number four. Essay number five. We're all in the same boat and can't get out. America was founded by people who wanted to get away from other people. The Pilgrim Fathers decided that they would rather run the risk of starving to death in a new, clean, unpeopled land than to live any longer with their neighbors. After them came men of various sorts political offenders, Quakers who would rather emigrate than fight, Irishmen again the government, roving sons of settled households. All sorts of people, but driven by the same common motive the desire to live their own lives in their own way. Free from the restrictions of an older social order. We are the descendants of those daring pioneers. Their vigorous individualism flows through our veins. If before the war you had put your ambition into words, you would probably have expressed the wish to be absolutely independent. I don't know what the war may have done to you, but to me it has revealed this one tremendous truth that there is not, and never will be again, any absolute independence. That I, in my little home, am absolutely dependent, to some degree or other, on every other man and woman in the world. In the Balkans, an Austrian prince, of whom I never heard, and his wife are murdered. A petty, faraway event. What has it to do with me? Nothing, of course. Nothing, except to throw my life into disorder and change the whole thought and current of my days. 
In Russia, twenty million men are taken from the farms, and behold, the loaf of bread in my little home feels their leaving and fades away. Millions of shoes are ordered for the men of Italy, and the shoes I purchase for my baby cost four dollars now instead of two. Absolute independence! What a foolish phrase indeed! The world has become a neighborhood, and the welfare of every single house along the street is conditioned by the welfare of every other. There is hardly an item in the newspapers that doesn't, somehow or other, come straight home to me. I read that the railroads are hard up and their stocks and bonds decline. I should worry. I own no stocks or bonds. Ah, but don't I though? The savings bank where my few dollars lie has invested them in railroad bonds. The life insurance company that must look after my wife and family if I die has invested its funds in railroad bonds. Whether I like it or not, the railroads cannot be hurt without hurting me. For better or for worse, my prosperity is bound up with theirs. When the Apostle Paul was being sent to Rome, the ship on which he sailed was tossed by the storms. At the moment of greatest danger, Paul caught the sailors taking to the boats. Stop! he cried, and to the centurion he shouted, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Today, the good ship, World, is being tossed about by the greatest storm of its existence. And now, in the time of greatest danger, I see some signs that are not good. I see some capitalists taking to the boats and saying to themselves, We'll pull out and play safe, no matter what may happen to the ship. I see some groups of labor taking to the boats and saying to themselves, When the ship is sinking is a good time to strike for higher pay. And if the lesson of the war means anything, it seems to me to mean just this, that the time has passed in the world when any single group of men can advance its interest permanently at the expense of the common good. Unless all of us, rich and poor, stick together in the ship, then all of us are lost. Individualism, as we used to understand it, is dead. God hath made of one blood all nations. The same great life-giving current flows through the veins of every class and race and people everywhere, and the only way to advance the interests of any class permanently is to purify and strengthen the stream of life that ministers to all. That, it seems to me, is one great lesson of this war. End of Essay Number 5 Essay Number 6 What? Little Johnny Dugan? I visited once the boyhood home of a great man. His name will not go down in the histories, but he has made a high place for himself in his profession, and in every city important people are glad to be counted among his friends. I spoke of this to one of the residents of the village who occupied a reserved seat in front of the library stable. It must be a matter of great pride to your town to have produced a man like that, I said. You mean Joe Hinkle? he answered. I nodded, and he uttered a scornful little laugh. Folks hereabouts don't think so much of Joe Hinkle, he commented. We never supposed he'd amount to anything. Why, gosh, I knew him when he was running around with his pants held up by one suspender. I found more than one man in that community to echo the sentiment. They could not quite reconcile themselves to the thought that a boy who had been one of themselves should have traveled so far beyond them. Some years ago, a song was popular in the vaudeville houses. It recounted the achievement of a certain John Dugan. And after each stanza, the chorus broke in with an incredulous exclamation, What? Little Johnny Dugan? Little Johnny Dugan, that little fellow who used to be around here, you don't mean to tell me that he's been nominated for governor, or elected president of a bank, or called to the pastorate of a great church? Not our little Johnny Dugan. It can't be. Why, we knew him when... The song reflected accurately the attitude of too many hometowns toward their boys. Many great men have suffered from that attitude. Jesus of Nazareth suffered, perhaps most keenly of all. After he had begun his ministry, after he had performed a few miracles in the cities near at hand, and gained a considerable reputation, he went back to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. One can picture the anticipation with which he turned his face in that direction. 
He could imagine the warmth of his old neighbor's greeting, the pride they would feel in his success which had brought credit to the town. But there was no warmth, only skepticism and jealousy and scorn. It was as if their faces cried, We know you, why, you're only the son of the carpenter, Joseph. You may have fooled them in Capernaum, but you can't fool us. And there were those among them whose envy and bitterness would have led them to hurl him to death. There are two ways to look at the folks around us, and particularly the young folks. One way is to get in the habit of regarding them as just common people, destined to failure or to only mediocre things, and to be surprised when they exceed our expectations. The other way is to form the habit of thinking of them in the biggest and best possible terms. Of holding up the vision of large achievement before them, and letting them understand that we expect them to climb high. Whichever attitude we adopt, we're bound to suffer certain disappointments. But personally, I prefer to be disappointed by news of failure rather than by news of success. When I hear that Johnny Dugan has been sent to jail for forgery, I expect to exclaim, What? Little Johnny Dugan? But when they tell me that the Republicans have nominated him for governor, they needn't expect me to express surprise, even though he has red hair and never owned two suits of clothes as a boy. Governor Johnny Dugan. Of course. I always said you couldn't keep that boy down. End of essay number six. Essay number seven. First, have a look at the figures. At the very beginning of the war, Lord Kitchener announced to his people that it would last for at least three years. I can remember now the editorial that appeared in one of the most sedate and respected of our newspapers, taking him to task for his foolish statement. It was the one sided view of a purely military man, said the editor. A three years war was unthinkable. The common sense of the world would not permit it. Kitchener is dead, but Kitchener was right. He was not a very brainy man. On the contrary, his teachers found him rather dull and listless. Men who conversed with him were embarrassed by his mental slowness. I will venture to say that the editor who wrote that article criticizing him was far more than his equal in all around intelligence. But Kitchener's teachers noted one bright spot in his otherwise indifferent school record. He was very good at mathematics. I sometimes think there should have been another beatitude. Blessed are the mathematicians, for they shall inherit the earth. It is the nature of us common folks to live on hope instead of facts. The eyes that we turn to the future are fitted with rose tinted glasses. We see coming events shaping themselves as we would like to have them shape themselves. The thing that should be is the thing that will be, in all our prophecies. Those cynical gentlemen who make their living on the stock exchange recognize that quality in us and trade upon it. The public is always bullish in their parlance, by which they mean that every common man of us believes that the shares of stock which he has bought are sure some day to sell higher. We hold on to our shares, disregarding danger signals, and long after the professional has begun to sell, we are buying still. One reason why the prophet is never honored in his own country is that the true prophet must so often foretell unpleasant things, and the world does not like to face unpleasant things. Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. No man among us would want to see that divine spark of hopefulness lost out of human character. Nevertheless, in our optimism, we would do well to remember this that hope based on hard facts, on a willingness to face the truth, is a thousand times more useful than hope based on nothing but other hopes. Read Luke 14.31, wired Cecil Rhodes to Dr. Jameson, before the latter set out on his celebrated raid. And Jameson, calling for a Bible, turned to that verse and read, Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? It is a good verse to read occasionally in days like these. Apply it to your own affairs. Have you had occasion lately to take account of stock? Do you know in black and white just what the chances for you and against you are? 
Suppose today you figure them up carefully and courageously, giving the odds against you full credit for their strength. If you are the man you ought to be, you will not be dismayed, no matter how strong the adverse figures may appear. Indeed, you will find fresh courage in the fact that you have taken the full measure of your enemies, that the power which you present against them is made up not merely of hope, but of hope reinforced and made vital by fact. End of essay number seven.